here. Here. Ah, dollar. <laughs> Oh, throw it in there right by that bush. That's good, that's good. Do that. <laughs> the lines don't mean anything. I'll, I'll, I'll get some out here, though. Okay, there you go. Okay, quiet. What do you want, uh, Coach? You want me to say the other line or just to think? Yeah, say the other line, but just look at that. No, when you get up, I mean, you, you know. Okay, first thing. And rub your butt. I hear you. Is Chuck out? Yes, sir. All right, we're rolling. Mm. Dust. <laughs> ah. <sighs> thanks. I like that. He just takes the wind and just says, thanks. They want action pictures, damn it. That's what we're getting paid for. Try it again. Print the other two takes. American West of John Ford. You'd have to look hard to find them, but 90,000 people live here, the entire Navajo Nation. There are no television antennas or telephone poles. It's just like, just like it was when America was 13 colonies and a dream. This place makes it seem like it wasn't that long ago. On the maps of Arizona and Utah, this is called Monument Valley. But to me, it'll always be John Ford country. As a matter of fact, folks call this Ford's Point. When you stand here and look around you, you don't have to ask why John Ford loves to make westerns or why we like to go see them. I've been a student of John Ford for a few years. He doesn't make pictures about good guys or bad guys. He makes stories about people. They bend or they break or hold their ground depending on the kind of people that they are. Of course, when Westerns were first being made, it was a different story. Shoot 'em ups, they called them. The hero wore a white hat, wasn't afraid of anything, always got the girl. They were short, simple, and except for a few stars like Harry Carey, easily forgotten. In 1924, the Iron Horse broke the pattern. It wasn't short or simple. It was an epic, an action spectacle that ran two hours and 40 minutes. The plot wasn't just good guys versus bad guys. The Iron Horse was the story of a nation's determination to unite itself with a continent-spanning railroad. This was no horse opera. This was a whole new way of looking at the American West. No one before or since has been able to get on film the vitality and sheer beauty of the West. When Pappy found Monument Valley, he found a subject equal to his talent. He came here for the first time in 1938, brought me with him. The picture, stagecoach. I was 30 years old then. Been around pictures for about 10 years. I'd made dozens of westerns with other directors, but except for a bit part here and there, I hadn't worked with Pappy. Stagecoach was not only the first film he shot in Monument Valley, it was also the first western he'd made with sound. And the first time he'd ever worked with me. You may need me in this Winchester, Curly. Saw a ranch house burning last night. You don't understand, kid. You're under arrest. Took 
took us about six weeks to make that picture. It was fun all the way. Pappy always knew how to keep what we call a happy set. And I was usually the butt of the jokes on that happy set. I remember once I, I was a new boy then, and I was working with a lot of wonderful actors, and after we'd been on the picture for about three weeks, Jack said, uh, would you like to go see some of the picture? I said, gosh, I should say. He says, well, go take a look at it and see if you can come up with any ideas. Well, I went in to see the picture, and the only thing that I could see wrong was I had asked the prop man to bring along one of those uh, arm stretchers, because if you put that on the other end of the lines, then whoever's driving the stagecoach, it looks more natural. Well, he forgot to bring that. So this fellow that was driving the stagecoach was sitting up there, and it was tough on him because he had to shake the lines this way rather than have the natural pull. So when I got back to set, Jack said, uh, what's the matter? I said, well, the fellow driving the stagecoach is just sitting up there jogging. He says, hold it. Everybody come down. He brought the electricians down out of the flies. He brought everybody down into the middle of the set. And he says, well, Duke's made it. He thinks he's great, and that fellow driving the stagecoach is horrible. Well, we all had a good laugh about it later, but right then I felt about that big. Well, are you still mad at me, Duke? Oh, it would take a special kind of a man to still be mad after 30 years, Coach. You're talking about the fellow, the fat fellow, the ex-cowboy that drove the stagecoach. Yeah, what was his name? Oh, I don't know what his name was. We couldn't get Ward born because he couldn't drive a six up, and we got this ex stunt man. I don't know what ever happened, and the last thing I knew of me. I can't believe it. Is that Andy Devine? Hey, Andy, you still mad? You're doing all the fat parts. You mean that literally, I suppose. Huh. <laughs> I was just telling the audience a little about Stagecoach. First time we worked together, it seemed to me, right out here was one of your setups. Are you still trying to impress me with your expertise? No. I was just thinking about how many pictures we'd made together since then. How wonderful it is to be back up here again. And it's a living. Good living. Oh, they're engraved and everything. This is good to Jimmy Stewart. Well, I appreciate it very much, boss. I, uh, may have told you I have wired up, so I'll rifle upstairs. Mm -hmm. I see. For John Ford, making films has always been what he calls a job of work. But the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences has occasionally considered it more than just a living. In 1935, they presented an Oscar to John Ford for his direction of The Informer. Five years later, The Grapes of Wrath won him a second one. The next year, How Green Was My Valley was voted Best Picture of the Year, and John Ford won an Oscar for directing it. In 1942, John Ford was in the Navy, but he won an Oscar as the director and photographer of the documentary the Battle of Midway. One year later, Commander Ford won his fifth Oscar for another documentary, December 7th. In 1952, The Quiet Man put this one on his mantle. Six altogether, and not one of them for a Western. Now, maybe that's because the excellence of a John Ford Western is something that we all take for granted. Or maybe it's because He's made so many of them that even he has lost count. He made his first one when he was 22 years old. That was back in 1917. It was a two-reeler called the Tornado. And he wrote it and directed it. And he also worked as an actor in it. He made eight other pictures that year, all of them westerns. They, uh, 
didn't win any awards, but they weren't too bad for a young man learning his trade. And the memories of that year and of all the years in between, they're all scattered around the walls of this room. The deer skin was a gift of the Navajos after stagecoach. They called him Natani Nez, tall soldier. The thank you note was written by Shirley Temple after he directed her in Wee Willie Winkie. The photograph of Lincoln was used in Cheyenne Autumn. Here's a musical trio that never made it big. That's Pappy on the drums. I'm in the corner. The only real musician is a fellow in the middle, Danny Berzaghi. Danny was a fixture on almost every Ford picture. He was in some of them, but mostly he just played the accordion. On camera or backstage, music has always been an important part of John Ford's westerns. And by that, I don't mean background music. Pappy always told me that he'd rather hear good music than bad dialogue. But more than that, the music in a John Ford Western means something. It evokes a sense of tradition, a nostalgia for simpler times when all hope lay ahead, when Americans were convinced that the promise of America lay over the next rise, that greener pastures did, in fact, beckon from beyond the next mountain range. In search of that promise, pioneers walked across the continent. And for John Ford, they also danced. In Wagon Master, we can chuckle at the comedy romance between Alan Mowbray and Jane Darwell, but at the same time, we learn that there was more to pioneer life than fighting off Indian attacks. The music in this scene, Maureen O'Hara and Rio Grande, plays a different role. And for John Ford, there was no need for dialogue. The music said it all. a constant element in all his films. In Stagecoach, Claire Trevor got the job. She played a barroom girl with a heart of gold. Oh, oh. Doc, can they make a new town when I don't want to go? Do I have to now, go? Now, Dallas, don't you go making no fun. Do I have to go, Doc? Just because they say so. Now, Dallas, I've got my orders. Don't blame me. Now, Dallas, don't you go making no fun. Do I have to go, Doc? Just because they say so. Now, Dallas, I've got my orders. Don't blame these ladies. It ain't them. It is them. Doc, have I any right to live? What have I done? We're the victims of a foul disease called social prejudice, my child. These dear ladies of the Law and Order League are scouring out the dregs of the town. Come on. They are proud, glorified dregs like me. You get going, Doc, to your drum. <laughs> two of the kind. Just two of the kind. Take my arm, Madame la Comtesse. The Cumbrio awaits for the guillotine. Oh, wait, I get my bag, girls. I'll join you. Thomas Mitchell won an Academy Award for his portrayal of the drunken doctor. The characters are cliches now, but that's because there have been so many bad imitations of the original. In the film, is the searchers. Olive Carey sums up the philosophy of John Ford's pioneer women. Just so happens we be Texicans. Texican is nothing but a human man way out on a limb. This year and next maybe for a hundred more but i don't think it will be forever someday this country's going to be a fine good place to be maybe it needs our bones in the ground before that time can come that time she was a school teacher you know even disguised in eastern frills and fragility john ford's women lose none of their strength they're so clean and clear Scent of the deadly flower. That's me. Barbara. In My Darling Clementine, Kathy Downs could even get Henry Fonda as Wyatt Earp to take her to church. 
You are going to the services, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. I'd admire to take you. Thank you. The scene is simple, clear, and to the point. But to me, what's just as important as the way John Ford treats the characters? His admiration for Wyatt Earp and others who won the West at gunpoint is almost reluctant. While for women like Clementine, the sutlers, and the school marms, he gave his wholehearted respect. I'd like to hear something from Mr. Stewart. Is it what? right? <laughs> What you say? Uh, they said that. Hey, they'd you, like to hear something from Mr. Stewart. Stewart. In Cheyenne, Autumn, you, I remember you telling me that the reason you put me in as Wyatt Earp, that the, the, the whole picture was kind of serious and it needed an intermission, but you didn't want people to get out and get drinks and go to the bathroom, so you put me in as Wyatt Earp to keep them in their seats. Uh, and it actually was an intermission on film. Is, it, is that uh, correct? Well, I don't know, Jimmy. I don't... Yeah, that deck feels light. That little white, that little white deck. Wider. Yeah, I know. What? What? Over there in a Texas and get it back. There's 51 cards in that deck. Every citizen of Dodge stands ready to go out and whip it. I swear, I didn't palm it. Major, where's the card? What? If we shoot him, we won't have anyone left to play with. Gentlemen. That's a good point. <laughs> New deck. I just wondered if, if the reason, oh, you, I if the reason you had me playing Wyatt Earp to me. keep people from going to the bathroom, is, is, is that... <laughs> well, uh, that's, that's, quite a, that's quite a feather in your cap. <laughs> but uh, any chance I get to work with you or Henry, I would leap at the chance, I mean. I mean, that's why I'm here today. Yeah, well... I'm very flattered and pleased. Well, we love you, boss. You're a hell of an intermission, though. I didn't miss your name, I'll say that much for you. <laughs> no, I'd I like to I'll... tell a prank if I have enough film in the camera. Just tell it, they're not rolling. Oh, I want to tell this on film. Oh, roll them. Roll them. Roll them. Yeah. The gag that I remember most was when well, Mr. Henry formed on me. We are doing young Mr. Lincoln, and Henry... I had never met Henry, and the first time I saw him, he was in makeup. This is true, isn't it? Yeah. And we were on location up at Sacramento, working on the river. So we finished, and we got on the plane last night, and this very upstanding young man sat by me, and we started chatting. I said, would you like a smoke? And he says, no thanks. And I have some cigarettes, and you're smoking cigars. And I says, we've met before, haven't we? He says, yes, I believe we have. I said, well, I mean, uh, my name is John Ford. He says, fine. He said, my name is Henry Ford. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and this is true, isn't it? <laughs> and I had never seen him without the makeup, and I didn't even recognize him. So that's a true story. Yeah. And that was a prank you pulled on me. In Fort Apache, Ford created his own version of the Battle of Little Bighorn with Henry Fonda in the role model on Custer. Ford's version may be at variance with history, but his interest was not in the man, but in the hero. His concern was not with assignment of blame or placement of glory. His interest was in the birth of a legend. To John Ford, Fort Apache was a eulogy to an era, and perhaps his way of saying that heroes are men, after all. No man died more gallantly, nor won more honor for his regiment. He's become almost a legend already. He's the hero of every schoolboy in America. But what of the men who died with him? Uh, what of Collingworth and... Collingwood. Oh, of course, Collingwood. That's the ironic part of it. We always remember the Thursdays, but 
The others are forgotten. You're wrong there. They aren't forgotten because they haven't died. They're living. Right out there. Collingwood and the rest. And they'll keep on living as long as the regiment lives. Their pay is $13 a month, their diet beans and hay. Maybe horse meat before this campaign is over. Fight over cards or rot gut whiskey, but share the last drop in their canteens. Faces may change, names, but they're there. They're the regiment, the regular army. Now and 50 years from now. They're better men than they used to be. Thursday did that. He made it a command to be proud of. Maybe that's not the way things were, but it's the way they should have been. And that's a point of view John Ford took in almost every Western he ever made. He summed up his approach to history in a film I worked in in 1962. It was called The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. I played a senator, a lawyer, who got elected because the people thought he killed the bad guy. Well, of course, I didn't. John Wayne did. I'd say that was uh, Liberty Valance there now. Wouldn't you? Yes, I would. Uh, we'll, we'll be seeing you, Mr. Stoddard. Get out of that shadow, dude. As I recall it, Lee Marvin has never looked meaner than he did then. I was obviously no match for Lee, but Duke was. He and Woody Strode were across the street. Of course, I didn't know that, and neither did anybody else in town. All right, dude. This time. Right between the eyes. And in the picture, when I told the truth, You're not going to use the story, Mr. Scott? No, sir. This is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. He's right, Rams. And that's what John Ford does. He prints the legend. And that's a fact. John Ford has said that the best things in film happen by accident, and he may be right. When I went out to what used to be the back lot of 20th Century Fox, I didn't expect to find him there. Last time we'd worked together was in Mr. Roberts, and the first time was in young Mr. Lincoln. You remember where you are? Do you recognize this? No, I don't. That's a damn place, remember? What this? I have no idea where the hell we are. Well, because this is Olympic, I know that the Western Street had to be over there. Isn't this where the French Street was, a part of a French Street? You mean the Bernadette Street? No, 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 not the Bernadette Street. Now, where is it where you did, isn't this way, over there is where you did the walk in Lincoln? 
When talking about those days, I was reminded that I hadn't wanted to play Lincoln. And I was a little scared of the part, in awe of Lincoln, I suppose. And I remember Jack telling me then, in language a little too colorful to repeat, that I wasn't going to play the great emancipator, just a backwoods lawyer still wet behind the ears. He convinced me to do it as much by what he said as how he said it. You walked up the road, if you remember. I do. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget. God was looking down on us that day. The tears of the multitude, I think you said. Hmm? I think you said the tears of the multitude when it started to rain. I had a kid. Somebody came out the other day, came in fear and trembling to interview me. So I put him right at ease. I says, I guess when you get right down to it, John Ford is as much an actor like as he is a director. I got the feeling that he enjoyed playing the cantankerous old man, making jokes with the crew, having a good time razzing one of the fellows who'd gone to Yale. At one point, he even broke into a chorus of the Whiff and Poof song. From the tables down to Morris. I understand Morris being sued. What happened to Morris? They're being sued by women's lip. He told me that a writer had come to see him that week to interview him. The result, I gathered, satisfied him, but didn't give the writer much material to work with. I didn't tell him anything. <laughs> John Ford will talk about anything but himself. That makes him an easy man to like and a hard man to explain. That was the unique thing about working with Ford. He made you feel related to each other. Actors, technicians, everybody, part of his family. I'm not saying that he's not the hard-nosed, cantankerous, do-it-my-way-or-not-at-all director he claims he is, but he's also a sentimentalist, and there are several generations of film workers who will vouch for that. For the ladies, who in this case is another Ford regular, Mildred Natwick. I just had a nip. Cannon, quick step, march. Ma'am. Aren't you ashamed? Eight of you picking on one poor man. Twenty-seven, ma'am. Forward, you! Comedy is what John Ford claims he does best. And I don't want to argue with him, but somebody said, I think it was Orson Welles, that John Ford is as much a poet as he is a comedian. Maybe he's both. For sure, he's a sentimentalist. To Jack, Victor McLaughlin wasn't just an actor, he was a friend. They made 11 pictures together. This was the 10th one in the last Western, Rio Grande. I feel better now. It'll kill you or cure you. Doctor, with your fine education, would you be telling me something? Yeah. What is an arsonist? An arsonist is a person that sets buildings on fire for profit or perverse excitement. Why? Uh, it all started when we rode down the Shenandoah Valley, Doctor. It was because it looked to be ordered to burn the crops and the barns at Bridesdale. She said it was owned by the same family ever since that grand Irishman, Sir Walter Riley, first smoked a pipe. Seems like I've heard that story before. And there's the black hand that did the dirty deed. I wish you'd knock it off with that stick. You see a lot of the same faces in Jack's pictures. Harry Carey Jr., Ward Bond, Jane Darwell. It was like being part of a large and loyal repertory company. Ward made 22, including my first Ford Western, my darling Clementine. And as for you, when Doc finds out you butted him last The girl is Linda Darnell. I'm the fellow pretending to be Wyatt Earp. I guess more people have asked me about this balancing act than almost anything else I've done. It wasn't in the script. It was just something Jack figured Wyatt Earp would do. So I did it. You remember the gunfight in the OK Corral in Clementine? 
Surely. Uh, I'd seen it a couple of times. I mean, the other other versions. Mm -hmm. How did you uh, come to stage it the way you did? Had you heard uh, Earp himself tell the story? Yeah, well, as I've told you, you know, as we've reminisced about this many times, when Wyatt Earp retired as a lawman, Henry, as you know, he went to some little town north of uh, Pasadena. Now, his wife was a very devout religious woman. And a couple of times a year, she'd go to these religious conventions in Utah and eastern Arizona, and Wyatt would get on a streetcar, go up to Universal City and join us. We became quite friendly, and I didn't know anything about the O.K. Corral at the time, but Harry Carey knew about it, and he asked uh, Wyatt, and Wyatt described the fight fully, exactly the way that you did it. As a matter of fact, he drew it out on paper, a sketch of the entire thing, and that's a Wyatt said I was not a good shot. I did close to a man. And that's exactly what you did. The Clantons were in a defensive position at the corral, Earp said. So he approached the situation as if it were a small-scale military campaign. The only advantage he, his brother Morgan, and Doc Holliday had was mobility. Doc Holliday's with him. The way Earp saw it, a frontal attack on the Clantons wouldn't do anything but get him killed. I remember the, uh, you know, when we shot it, you had a stagecoach or something coming through and raise a big cloud of dust That's that right. they used like the present day uh, smoke screen. That's right. Yeah. Did that, was that in, the, in his original story? Yes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he told me he had time to fall in, you know, he knew exactly when the stagecoach would come by the very dusty road and he waited his time and uh, when the stage coach came by you made your move and the others made their move but that's exactly the way it happened on it mr clanton let's talk a while hi well, now, you go right ahead and talk. I got a warrant here for you and your son, charging the murder of James and Virgil Earp. There's also a charge of cattle rustling. I'm giving you a chance to submit to proper authority. Will you come on right in here, Marshal, and serve your warrant? Which one of you killed James? I did. And the other one, too. I'm going to kill you. Doc Holliday's silk handkerchief isn't documented. But then, as I said, Jack used history. He didn't feel he was married to it. Pure Ford sentiment, but it had the ring of truth in it. Throw your gun down and come on out, old man. My boys, Ike, Sam, Finn, Billy. That day. I ain't gonna kill you. I hope you live a hundred years. Feel just a little what my pa's gonna feel. Now get out of town. Start wandering. The O.K. Corral and the town of Tombstone were built from the ground up in the corner of Monument Valley. But the interiors were done here. The same place where we made young Mr. Lincoln, drums along the Mohawk, and the Grapes of Wrath. They were good years. Very good years. When this was the back lot of 20th Century Fox. 
back. That's gone now. It's been homesteaded. Monument Valley is so identified with John Ford, it's been said that if anybody else made a picture here, they'd be accused of plagiarism. A shot like this, a man on a horse riding against a background of harshness and beauty, that's a John Ford trademark. He doesn't just tell you a story, he writes a poem about it. He doesn't just point the camera, he paints a picture with it. I guess what John Ford has been doing for close to half a century is showing his love for the West by putting in motion the moods of Remington and Russell. He's shown us a big country and people who seem big because they were part of it. He gave us something to look up to. Like Jimmy Stewart says, when it comes to a choice between what really happened and what should have happened, John Ford prints the legend. The legend has become our folklore and the Western, the most colorful part of our American heritage. It's the way we keep in touch with our past. But the Western has become something that we sadly take for granted. Can you imagine how it'd be without them? Be no cowboys or Indians or homesteaders or gunfighters? No covered wagons or stagecoaches? No villains, no heroes? It'd be like not having a soul. And working with John Ford, it's pretty hard not to pick up a few facts about making pictures. One of his first rules is not to pack too many ideas in one scene. And the second, don't talk too much. Come on, go, go. And the third rule is what hurts. A lot of action. This is the land rice scene from The Three Bad Men, made in 1926. Some directors would have settled for the spectacle, but Pappy wanted drama. He never missed an opportunity for humor or a chance to do what he called busting them up. Pappy liked contrast, and mood, and lighting, and pacing. He knew how to get everything there was out of a scene and how to put a period on it. Stop, Paul! Stop! Stop! When you pull a gun, kill a man. The Pappy always happened outside. And to get it started, all I'd have to say was... Get to Fort Grant. Tell them where we are. Tell them we may still be alive if they hurry. Move! He has said that on film he's killed more Indians than Custer. The fact is, he's never hurt anyone. It just looks that way. In all the stunts he's staged, never once was a man or a horse seriously injured. Oh, I picked up a bruise or two maybe here, and so did Hank. But that was in the line of duty. It was supposed to look dangerous. The granddaddy of all the chases Pappy put on film is the one in stagecoach. The villains were the Indians. We'd been dodging them for two-thirds of the picture. Hard, I think, once pointed out that if a chase like this 
had actually happened, the Indians would have shot the horses and that would have been that. But Pappy wasn't as interested in facts as he was in heroic tradition. Besides, it made a better story his way. One of the most spectacular stunts was performed by Yakima Canut. He's really an Irishman, by the way. His first name is Enos. This is how Pappy earned the reputation of being a hard-nosed old action director. He didn't rehearse anything. He took it any way it happened. the suspense going, he'd create crisis within crisis, action within action. I'd like to take credit for this stunt, but it was Yakima again. One of the best stunt men I've ever worked with. It was a dangerous piece of work, and I was satisfied to settle for the close-up. In those days, the cavalry always arrived in the nick of time, and the Indians always faded into the background until they were needed as villains again. Set the record straight, Pappy cast the Indians as heroes in the last western he made, Cheyenne Autumn. He did it, he said in an interview, because we've treated them so badly. In The Searchers, however, Pappy stuck with traditional casting, and in my opinion, it was one of the finest weapons that he ever made. Why don't you finish the job? What good did that do you? By what you preach, none. By what that Comanche believes. Ain't got no eyes, he can't enter the spirit land. Has to wander forever between the winds. You get it, Reverend. Come I on, played ahead. Ethan Edwards, a man whose niece, a young girl he hardly knew, had been captured by a band of Comanches. Two sons killed by white men. For each son, I take many scouts. It him ten years to track down the Comanches who had taken the little girl. And when he did, his hate was still intact. The problem was that the girl was now a woman, and the woman was now a Comanche. Yo, Ajay. Remus amongst them. You go! Edwards was probably the most fascinating character I ever played in a John Ford Western. Happy conceived Ethan as a complicated man, determined, ruthless, but somehow admirable. I was so impressed by him that I named one of my sons after him. Searchers has fascinated students of the John Ford Western world since it was first released in 1956. Maybe it does because it's an unhappy, happy ending. The lost girl, Natalie Wood, is found and returned to her family, John Quaylen and Olive Carey. Jeff Hunter and Vera Miles, the young lovers, are reunited. But Ethan Edwards, 
The man the story was all about is left standing outside all alone. The people have wondered what John Ford meant by that. He's never answered. I can't answer for him. I can only tell you what I had in mind. When I crossed my arm, I did it the way Harry Carey used to do it. Because his widow was on the other side of that door. And he was the man, Pappy said, taught him his trait. Jack Ford made all or part of nine westerns here in Monument Valley. When we came back in June, it was the first time we'd been here together in 15 years. The valley hadn't changed. It never does, but we had. Mostly just getting older, I guess. I came back to reminisce, and I got the feeling that maybe Pappy came back to say goodbye. You're going to take that over again. I see him. I hell no. I said, you came crossed out in the action. He said, what do you mean, action? I got him horsemen down on <laughs> Wayne almost rode over me. I said, oh, I think it looked good. I did, too. I just ran up on it. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the road there? Hmm? The coach came up there. Hmm? Mm hmm Right around there, right up to... The Indians right here. Mm -hmm. It's a very funny coincidence. The fellow we picked out as a Toronto actually is Geronimo's grandson. Is that right? No, we didn't find it. Harry just dug it out, not and told me. He was half Apache, half Navi. That's like that Mickey, uh what's his name? Mickey. The half Irish, half Indian. Oh, all son of a... Yeah, he's half, half Irish, Irish, half, half Indian, Indian Irish. and whole, whole son, son of a... Mickey? Yeah. <laughs> Memories come back. John Ford. Motion picture home, of course, country home. Yeah. As you always do. I mean, that's I'm not a career man. I never oh, was. Man. I'm just a hard-nosed, hard-working director. They'd hand me a script. I said, this ought to make a fair picture. This will make a good picture. I think it's going to be a lousy picture, but you have it scheduled, so I'll go ahead and do the best I can with it. But I never felt important or felt like just, I was a career director or a genius or any other damn thing. When you get your cue, just bust them and roll. Yes, sir. Okay. Ready, take off. When I pass on, I want to remember this John Ford, a guy that made westerns.